to the 2020 um, Explaining Andra Evening, presented with partnership with Gold Coast Private Hospital. We thank you so very much for your flexibility um, in moving this event from Gold Coast Private to an online setting. We're delighted you could um, join us and learn from a range of Gold Coast experts who are in the specific area of women's health in relation to endometriosis. The goal of this evening is for you to learn and take away knowledge and tools to add to your toolbox as both health professionals and women with endometriosis. As you are more than aware, March is Endometriosis Awareness Month, and I'd like to extend a heartfelt warm welcome to the women listening this evening uh, who suffer from endometriosis and applaud you for your continued advocacy along your health journey. Could you please give a warm welcome to Dr. Tina Fleming, She's our obstetrician and gynecologist at Gold Coast Private Hospital. Rebecca Lackey, who is a pelvic physio at, Go at Grace Private, um, at Gold Coast Private. <laughs> and I would also like to welcome Caroline Anderson, an ex-IVF nurse and now naturopath and the owner of Sage Neurotropy at Burley Heads. Good evening, everyone. Hi, guys. Thank you so hi, much. Annika. Oh, hi, Mom. <laughs> 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 How's <are you> going? <laughs> Love you. <laughs> Alrighty, so um, I'd like to just start with um, if everybody could introduce themselves and why you guys are passionate about the work that you guys do. Uh, my name's Tina Fleming. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and I'm uh, one of the co-directors of Grace Private, which is a women's health facility uh, on the Gold Coast. Um, we kind of started with this concept that there seems to be a lot of fragmentation around women's healthcare. We really wanted to be able to provide a, a one-stop shop or a facility whereby women could access all of the healthcare requirements under the one under the one roof. With this principle of bringing the care to the woman rather than the woman to the care. Um, and we've been around for the last four years. It's been an incredible journey um, where we've been able to. Uh, really build from the ground up a facility that uh, has very high quality healthcare providers across a multitude of disciplines, including Beck, who's our co-panelist, and Shani, our dietitian, who is also online here. Um, I've got uh, quite a lot of experience treating endometriosis. So in addition to your routine six years of training for obstetrics and gynecology, I've done an additional two years of subspecialty training in minimally invasive gynecology and had the privilege of working with some of what I consider to be the best um, surgeons across Australia as part of my training. And it's been such an honor and a privilege to be a woman of the Gold Coast and provide high quality, minimally invasive surgical options for them, in addition to um, being able to facilitate access to excellent multidisciplinary care, which is, I think, um, a really key feature that separates what we do from a lot of other services. Alrighty, Beck, did you want to go next? Yeah, yep. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm Rebecca Lackey. Um, I'm a physiotherapist um, and my special interest area is um, pelvic health. So I've been working solely in women's health now for about um, five or six years. Um, it's an, an area that I was always interested in once I graduated, it's probably not an area that I knew much about when I was studying. Um, and then over the years developed more and more interest, did more and more courses. Um, and then I'm lucky enough to work at Grace with um, Tina and with Shani as well. Um, I guess for me, like, like pelvic pain is an area that I just think is such an area of need and that we, we seem to be doing a better job at educating women about you know, you can have weak pelvic floors, you can have pelvic floors that mean that you have accidents and you wet your pants and lots of people know, oh, you should do your pelvic floor exercises um, so they don't have any accidents. But we, we're not really educating people well enough on the other end of the spectrum and the hypertonic or the overactive tight pelvic floor. And there's been linkages in the research to that with endometriosis. And now that I work with Tina, I treat that a lot. Um, it fills up the majority of my list. Um, so it's an area that I'm becoming more and more passionate about and I think that we have so much to offer from a multidisciplinary point of view um, in the treatment of that for women. Alrighty. 
and thanks back. And can we go to Caroline? Hi, Beth. Yeah. So um, my name is Caroline, and yes, I am a naturopath um, with Sage Naturopathics as my clinic. So my background: I, um, I graduated as a nurse about. 20 years ago um, and pretty soon went to London afterwards and got into IVF nursing over there. So I did IVF nursing there and then in Auckland and then moved to the Gold Coast. Um, and so within IVF nursing, I absolutely loved all the aspects of it. And obviously there were a lot of um, people within there with other conditions as well, such as um, endometriosis and their management of it. Um, and then I started to explore, while I, whilst I was nursing, um, the other options that people were, were doing there as well. So looking more into natural options. And um, yeah, I did that, uh, did my naturopathy degree for um, 10 years I ended up taking while I was working as an IVF nurse and studying at the same time. Um, and then a few years ago, we opened Sage Naturopathic, which is a specific women's health um, and fertility focused um, naturopathy clinic. So I work holistically with people um, who want to explore both natural options and they can go down the medical path and naturopathy at the same time. And, um, and I'm part of the team, I guess, of the, the management of it all from um, the natural side. So yeah, my background. Alrighty. Um, thank you so much, Caroline. Um, so the next question I have, um, is I'd just like, from your perspective as panellists, just define what endometriosis is. Now, I know a lot of you who are listening this evening um, have endometriosis, but there are some also people who are healthcare professionals um, who are listening in this evening. So I'd just like each of you to give like a little bit of a snippet on what endometriosis is or what it means to yourselves. Um, so look, I guess from the medical perspective, the definition is fairly easy and, and I think that I'll be preaching to the choir a lot of this because you're a fairly well-educated group of people here. Um, there are a lot of people in that I'm very familiar with, um, so I know that you kind of understand but for anyone who um, is unfamiliar, um, endometriosis is a very common condition. We know that it affects around one in ten women um, and that representation is much greater within the world of people who are trying to fall pregnant. Um, so one of the ramifications obviously is an increase in infertility. Um, the scientific definition is when there's tissue that um, is similar to that tissue that lines the uterus and it's that tissue that lines the uterus that thickens in response to hormones and that sheds in response to hormone withdrawal um, is implanted the tissue that is like that is implanted outside of the uterine cavity. Um, so this can be anywhere within the pelvis most commonly, but there are other non-common sites, including diaphragm, appendix, lungs. Um, so it is possible to be spread throughout the body, but for most women, this is located in the pelvis. Um, it has a number of flow-on effects. So um, probably the most common reason that people will present with endometriosis is because they're having pain with periods. Um, but the other role on effects around that can be pain with intercourse, difficulty with opening bowels, um, bladder frequency, pelvic floor hypertonicity, um, dietary intolerances, um, difficulty falling pregnant. So there's a huge spectrum in terms of presentation from something that has a fairly standardized definition. And we talk a lot about um, phenotypes. So you know, just because you have endometriosis doesn't mean you're going to present in a certain way. And some people with very severe disease don't in fact have a very severe phenotype or they don't express um, in a certain behavioral way. Um, and some people with fairly minor disease or stage one, for example, might express in a very severe manner. So just because you've got endometriosis 
the staging of it doesn't necessarily help us a lot in terms of being able to unpack all the symptomatology for you. So there's still a lot of research that needs to be done for, from our perspective in order to have better definitions of our diagnosis as well. Thank you so much, Tina. That's a really great comprehensive comprehensive definition of what endo is. And I really like how you place emphasis on your stage doesn't define the pain or the, the symptoms that you, you do present with. That's something really important, um, I think. Not a competition. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, Beck, what, what would you define endometriosis as and from your practice in seeing women for many years? So I guess from my perspective, the main um, time that Tina or one of the other doctors that I work with refers is because that they feel that there's some complications arising from the pelvic floor muscles being overactive. Um, so we know in the research there's a link between the two. I think that we think that it's due to protective muscle spasm, that the muscles kind of switch on um, because there's pathology there, not dissimilar to when you twist your knee and you hurt yourself and your quadriceps and your hammies switch on to kind of give you some of that protection. It's the same thing. The difficulty, I think, is that with a condition like endometriosis, it, it doesn't kind of get better in six weeks and then the muscles switch off again. And so it kind of ends up going into that pain cycle where the muscles become really tired. And where this is an issue or where it kind of presents can be those symptoms Tina was just talking about where people will say like, you know, intercourse hurts, trying to insert tampons hurts. Um, often the, they'll get referral pain from just the fact that the muscles are tight. And so people that are coming in with abdominal pain or lower back pain or, you know, just general pelvic pain as an umbrella term, sometimes that can be due to um, hypertonic pelvic floor or overactive pelvic floor. So my role is largely around trying to do something about that for the muscles. So um, I say to the patients that come in, like, you know, a lot of the things I'm going to ask you to do are going to seem really strange um, and probably a little bit potentially confronting, but really they're still skeletal muscles and it's exactly the same as if you came in and your calf muscle was tight. I would stretch it, I would massage it, I would give you um, exercises so that you could actively lengthen it. We're going to do the same thing. It's just going to be weird because they're in your vagina. So it's exactly the same treatment as a normal musk physio if you're coming in with a tight muscle. And our approach is exactly the same. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Beck. You guys do play a really critical role in the management um, of pelvic pain. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And um, Caroline? Yeah, so, I mean, absolutely, exactly. Um, from my perspective, naturopathy takes on um, exactly what Tina was saying and Rebecca was saying about there being different parts to it. From my side, I am particularly interested in the inflammation and the immune dysregulation component to it and what potentially are some drivers behind that individual's inflammation. So that can be very individualized and that's where it is no one size fits all like anything to do with endometriosis, but um, somebody's one person's driver um, may be very different to the next person. So. I am, um, you know, digging deep as to what I think may be some of this um, activation and the driver behind the immune dysregulation. I'm particularly, um, from a hormonal perspective, that's also a, a very um, important consideration where people may have things such as where they have constipation and they, um, they then their hormones are not getting excreted appropriately, they're getting recycling of the hormones and then higher estrogen levels, which can then end up making this whole process, um, situation worse. So I um, really dig deep with people into finding out exactly what is going on for their um, endometriosis, how it's presenting for them, 
and then what I can be doing to um, assist them to kind of shift shift all of that to um, to try and get that immune system to to stop being so active there and then which is then going on and causing the pain for people so that's um that's a, a key focus of of my management with somebody um with endometriosis i just uh, do you mind if i just interject there i think sorry carolyn I yeah think, no that's fine the amazing things about this particular meeting and one of the reasons i was really excited to be a part of it is that i think traditionally we, and if you look at management still by, by many providers, it's been you do your operation, you go away, you might get a pill, you might get marina, and then you come back in 12 to 18 months and you have your surgery again. And that kind of management is really out the window. And I think this panel is really representative of um, the importance of having um, a really multidisciplinary approach to the surgery. Um, and to the management of this condition and doing surgery alone is no longer good enough um, and it's, it's not okay to just have an operation and it get better. You really need to have this entire package and when you can hear what Bit can add and you can hear what Caroline's adding, it's clearly coming about it from an entirely different approach and, and as gynecologists we're completely kidding ourselves if we feel like we can you know, provide that complexity as an individual, you really need to utilize people who have had things. And, and as Caroline reflected, it's so individualized. The management really has to be tailored to do that patient. You can't just be a blanket one size management strategy. So can I ask on that, Tina, um, a question that I did have for later on, but I, I'm happy to ask it now. When is additional surgeries warranted for endometriosis? Yeah, it's a really tricky question. And I think in an ideal setting, one of the big focuses of our endometriosis task force is looking at um, trying to rationalise care for women with endometriosis to try and shorten the duration of time to diagnosis, to be able to try and provide um, diagnosis and management at an appropriate site and ongoing care. One of our big fo focus is to try and reduce the interval between surgeries and trying to reduce the number of surgeries done in total. Um, one of the difficulties with this is that as doctors, we're really incentivized by surgeries in that that is where the majority of our income is being generated. So really a lot of the onus of that has to fall upon us to try and minimize the number of surgeries by maximizing the use of our allied health professionals. When is the right time to have surgery? So I guess there's really good evidence that your first surgery done well by somebody who specializes in endometriosis is going to yield the longest result. Um, so you're going to get your best benefit if you're having a good operation done the first time by somebody who specializes in endometriosis surgery per se, ideally in an excisional endometriosis surgery. Um, we know that the duration um, between surgery tends to degenerate over time. So you would ideally get five years and then the usual decay is you get three years, then two years between the surgery. And ideally between that, there'll be some childbearing and some protection from the progesterone of pregnancy and the progesterone of breastfeeding. Um, what are the triggers for surgery? It's a really tricky one. Again, it's very, very individualized. And I think that um, for most people, we would aim to, if you've had your initial diagnostic procedure and that's been done well by somebody who does endometriosis surgery, um, we would really look to optimize the use of all of our other tools in our trade. So be that hormonal management, be that using um, our physios, our dietitians, our naturopaths as additional help to try and continue to prolong effect from the initial surgery. Um, but the when is usually triggered by when the symptoms of endometriosis are having a repeat impact on somebody's life. And I think, you know, this isn't a how much pain is too much. It's really a for you, the individual patient, is your pain now stopping you from being able to go to work? Is, are you making changes to your life because you know you're going to have your period or you know that your pain is going to come in a different way? You know, is this impacting on your relationship now? So these are the kind of questions that really, really help to drive surgery appropriately or not. And probably the other thing that's a big deal is 
did you get benefit following your last procedure? Because I know a lot of people who want to come in for another surgical procedure, but for whom they found very little benefit from their sort of surgical procedure. And, you know, that's the definition of insanity. Thank you so much, Tina. I might ask um, Rebecca uh, a question now. Um, so as your role as a pelvic physio, what are the main treatments that you focus on with women with endometriosis or specifically with pelvic physio? What, is, what can you expect from a consultation? So the, the, the main thing I think probably to expect when you come in, which um, occasionally does surprise people, but I think most people aren't blindsided, is that we will do an assessment um, where we'll do a vaginal exam so that we can palpate the muscles to see what kind of state that they're in. Um, it absolutely is possible to have pain and not have a hypertonic pelvic floor where the treatment would be different. Um, but in the majority of cases, there usually is some kind of muscle spasm. Um, so I will assess for that to begin with. And then based on that assessment, the treatment varies a little bit. Um, I will almost always give um, relaxation strategies to begin with. So um, I tend to explain to people that, you know, your pelvic floor is very much linked to the way that you're feeling and people who are quite in tune with their pelvic floor will say like I can almost feel it tightening and often it'll be like in the circumstance of my partner's making advances and I know that intercourse is going to be painful um, and I can almost feel that my muscles are tightening up um, and so with those people, like I'll explain to them, you know, like humans are really similar to dogs in that when dogs are afraid or they're fearful or they're stressed, their tail will go between their legs, which is their pelvic floor muscles contracting. And it's exactly the same with humans. So the first thing I try to focus on is trying to get people really well linked to their pelvic floor so that they can, you know, feel what it's like when it's relaxed, feel what it's like when it's tightening. Um, so we'll always do exercises to make them in tune with that. So I'll kind of, I, I tend to call them reverse pelvic floor exercises, but you'll also see them in the literature around the places, down training of the pelvic floor, um, which to me is, is really about the relaxation side of it, of getting people to feel like, what does it um, switch on like? What does it feel like when it's relaxed? Um, I'll usually give them some stretches. It's very rare that the pelvic floor will be tight on its own. You'll usually have um, tightness in the adductors, tightness in the glutes, um, the hip external rotators. So I'll give them a stretching program for that. Um, I'll usually give them some recommendations on some meditation that they can do to try to relax their pelvic floor down. Um, and then we'll usually do some massage. So depending on what they're like on assessment, I'll usually do some manual therapy in the session. Um, depending on how it goes, I might bring them back a bit more regularly to do a little bit of that in clinic. And those are the ones generally that, you know, the introitus is really tight and there's lots of spasm and it's quite, you know, they're not at the stage that I can recommend dilator therapy or a um, pelvic wand to go home and do self-massage. Um, but if they're at that level at the start, then generally that's what I'll do. So there's not a lot of sessions from my perspective. Um, they'll come in the first time. I'll usually send them off to buy a tool before they come back. Then when they come back, I'll teach them how to use it, depending on what it is that I've recommended, which will depend on their assessment. Um, and then I'll send them off for a big chunk of time, usually somewhere between six and eight weeks where they might do that self-massage themselves. And then I'll get them to come back in so I can check and go, where are we at? Do we need to change anything? Are we on the right path? Um, so I know that there's people that work in different ways and that other pelvic floor physios will be bringing patients in weekly. I tend not to do that. I think, especially for endometriosis, this is something that you'll potentially be treating on an ongoing basis um, because endometriosis is a bugger in that it continues to grow back. So I think it's better that if I give people tools in their tool belt that they can use on an ongoing basis that when they can kind of, you know, if they're really in touch with their pelvic floor and they go, I can feel that it's tightening up or they're getting symptoms, they've got things that they can do at home without having to represent and come back where I manually do it for them. Um, and there's a question I can see on the side. So no, it's a, it is a specialty area, Kelly. So you have to go off and do um, further study. This isn't something that gets taught um, at undergrad um, level. Um, I actually do teach the women's health component at Bond University here on the coast. Um, so 
like to say that they love it. It's probably 75% like sporty boys. So I'm not sure that they do. I love it. I think it's really great when I get them all trapped in a room for a week and talk to them about like really honing on like the red flags of if you have somebody who comes in and kind of mentions to you like any of these symptoms, you should be sending them on. But it's definitely a specialty area. Um, it's one of those things that um, what you want to know if you're looking for one, because sometimes and something that does irritate me a little bit I think sometimes there's not a clear distinction between um, some a, a physiotherapist who's working in women's health and a physiotherapist that's a woman and I've had patients that have been to clinics that have been booked in with someone who's a women's health physio um, but on questioning I doubt that that person has actually because if they haven't done an internal exam and they're putting an ultrasound scanner in and get on and giving advice then it's probably likely they haven't been trained as women's health and what you want is you want someone who can do internal exams and has done that specialty training so it's worth asking that question oh, sorry Say, Jeff, I think Sorry. one of the important things that you discussed there was being able to empower the to have the skills to um, be able to do some of the physio treatment for themselves. So this is this is multifactorial in terms of the way that it helps the same thing. We know that endometriosis women are going to be more at risk in the long term and we are definitely the support crew around them, but ultimately a big part of um, having control of endometriosis is being able to uh, feel as though you're in the driver's seat. And I think having those tools really does give you the ability to be in the driver's seat a little bit more. I think the other really important thing about educating people to be able to self-manage as much as possible is that, and I'm sure that lots of people here tonight would really empathise with this, it becomes such a drain financially. Um, it's really difficult to be attending full well and good sessions But the fact of the matter is that if you've got a chronic condition and you're having to attend lots of appointments, it can actually become quite a stress. And particularly because a lot of people are under 30 and, you know, often working in non-professional roles. So it's <laughs> your family. <laughs> yes, my husband just came home, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so as a result, being able to have skills that they can eat, they can... Um, take home to be able to do themselves instead of having to be reliant on seeing you for that service is fantastic. And I think, and personally, I feel like that's really important. Um, you know, that, that this is something that you're taught to manage yourselves. Yeah. Um, there was a, um, oh, no, never mind. I think it's a question that I meant to type. Sorry, I've never used Zoom before. This is my first time. And apparently it's okay. that says privately, so I think I can just type that answer to them. Can you hear me now? Is this better? Should I just hover so that I look like the scary person on... Maybe just go closer to your mic, Tina. Because you're playing... You're playing you're that's a lot better. where my mic is. <laughs> no idea. Can you hear me more when I'm closer? Yeah, that's heaps that's, better. Yeah, that's a lot better. Now it's yeah, like... that's heaps better. Scary face, but... Busy, but <laughs> ah. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, I think we should maybe go to Caroline. Um, just a question on, um, that's my, there you go. Um, can you, um, use natural therapies whilst also following the Western, um, medicine pathway? So is it great? Like, can you work in conjunction, um, with, yeah, Western treatments? So if a patient is say on the pill or on Zolodex, um, are there still natural options that you can implement for patients yeah and and absolutely short answer yes um and i just as as we have kind of covered i very much see myself as part of that t team and management mm. and i i'm driven by what the client wants wh whether for them it is um you know to have surgery and like tina mentioned try to minimise um, it growing back again and it becoming an issue further down the track. Other people want to try to avoid surgery, so I work with, um, with that. But, um, but absolutely, so when somebody comes to see me for a consultation, I will go through 
all of their history, you absolutely find out exactly what they've had as far as surgeries, what medications that they're on. Um, and, and I will spend a long time, um, up to potentially an hour and a half with somebody going through exactly what, um, what their endometriosis means for them and what um, issues are the biggest concern for them. Obviously, pain management is a huge part of that, but that, that in itself can be different. Um, the issue of pain can be different for each, each person. So um, when, going back to your question, when um, I find out exactly what the person wants, then I just adjust accordingly. So nutrition is a really big part of um, my treatment plan with somebody. And that also then goes into gut health. All of that really um, can be done without it interfering um, at all with any medications. Um, from the nutrients and herbs side of things, there are some that work really well and actually can improve the way that medications work. And then others that I would avoid because I go, well, what's the point? You're, you're on medication, you're dealing with it. That way, let's focus on other aspects um, within naturopathy. I'm also conscious as well, some medication that's an absolute necessity for that person, but it, it may um, have nutrient, uh, deplete nutrients um, for somebody. So I'm really conscious as well on making sure that somebody's on a medication longer term, what's, what that's actually doing for them and, and ensuring that their nutrient levels are okay. Um, so yes, it, it, as you've picked up, it's very individualized um, and the treatment plans, while there's certain themes that go through um, and certain things that everyone would benefit from with endometriosis, there's also a lot of individualized um, instructions or um, resources and um, uh, things to focus on um, within within that. Another big part of it, and it's kind of covered by everyone here, is the stress management component of it. And the more tools that people can get, because for one person, one um, thing to de-stress just doesn't resonate with another person. Um, you know, some people might just love journaling, and other people go, oh, I'm never going to sit there and, and write a word. So I really spend the time going through finding out what, what people like and then giving them resources more in, in that direction. Um, and particularly as well, there are some absolute basic things such as sleep and sleep management. And if somebody, for whatever reason, it might be it's nothing to do with their endometriosis, but they're just not getting decent sleep, or it may be to do with their endo. But um, if somebody is chronically tired, their pain management is going to be so much worse. So I'll look at different strategies, whether it be through nutrients, herbs, or just um, ideas and you know meditations and, and things like that to help them with their sleep, which then in turn may help with their pain management. Yeah. Caroline, do you have anything that is like a standard that you, you know, you prescribe women with endometriosis? Do you have any specific one, not one size fits all, but one form of treatment that you, you could suggest for women? Um, look, one of the first areas that I would um, definitely explore with somebody is nutrition and foods that just don't suit them. So common ones that do come up, and it's not for everybody, but common ones that do come up are things like dairy can aggravate it more. Um, and some people find a lot of relief when they remove dairy, replace it with really good nutritious, um, you know, other options that are suitable for them. Um, and, 
uh, it could be something like eggs or gluten. These are fairly common ones. Um, so if you just know that a food doesn't sit right with you, give it a trial for a few weeks and see how you feel completely removing that food rather than just, you know, not having too much of it and see whether your symptoms do improve. Um, another big focus is on anti-inflammatory foods there. So um, a, a big favorite of everyone is turmeric. Um, yes, try and get lots of uh, good turmeric, but the, the master foods, um, you know, sprinkling, sprinkling a little bit of something, that's unfortunately just not gonna cut it. Um, it, it needs to be the good stuff with high curcumin, um, which you can get from health food shops, but a lot of people do end up needing um, turmeric supplements in pretty decent doses to get their pain management under control. Um, and then things like fish oils can work really well. That's also working on the, the inflammation component of it. Magnesium is a big favorite. That um, covers both the stress management, hormones. It's, it's a real kind of key one. Um, there are quite, kind of quite a few um, that, that are pretty standard in most people's management um, of, of endo. Yeah. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you so much for your insight. It's fantastic. Um, and we might go back to um, Tina. Bit of a question for yourself. Um, a question that um, comes up quite frequently at events like this and also um, on the online space is, can a hysterectomy cure my endometriosis? Oh, mate, I would guarantee that almost everybody who's on this page and who's listening to us right now already I hope no. to that. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. look, doing a hysterectomy without removing endometriosis is completely and utterly futile. Doing a hysterectomy for the cohort of women who are most commonly being affected by this pain is absolutely futile. Um, it, it's like saying a baby cures endometriosis. It's like saying, you know, you know just forget about it. You're going to get better. Like there's a whole bunch of myths that just need to stop circulating essentially. And a hysterectomy curing endometriosis is one of them. And I think, you know, I would be very comfortable that most of the people who are listening here tonight are very aware of the fact that a hysterectomy isn't a cure-all. Having said that, there will be a small proportion of women for whom a hysterectomy does offer relief. So um, we are all familiar with that uh, association between endometriosis and adenomyosis. So adenomyosis is the ugly cousin of endometriosis. There's certainly a lot of cross-pollination for those people who have endometriosis and who also have coexisting adenomyosis. So going back to our definitions, if we're saying, can you hear me by the way? Am I scary face enough? Yeah, it's um, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we're saying that endometriosis is when there's tissue that is similar to the lining layer that's implanted outside of the uterus, um, adenomyosis is when tissue that's similar to the lining layer implants within the muscle of the uterus. And this is traditionally very hard to treat. Um, we have a series of hormonal managements that we use to try to manage it, but it doesn't ever go away, just like endometriosis doesn't ever really go away. Um, and for that cohort of patients, um, it's quite likely that a hysterectomy will offer them some relief, but that's more for relief from adenomyosis than endometriosis. Yeah, thank you for that, Tina. Um, and just another question for yourself. Um, what does endometriosis, if you have endometriosis, um, what does that mean for fertility? If you don't mind of course, touching on that. One of the things, it's a conversation that I have every single day. I've got a 22 year old girl, new diagnosis of stage three endometriosis. She's sitting there with her mother or her partner and you know, in tears often concerned that she's never going to be able to have a family. So what does, what does it mean? I guess the first thing about having a diagnosis of endometriosis is that you're now in power because you know what's going on, you know what's been causing your symptoms, and you can be on the front foot rather than on the back foot in terms of trying to 
proactively treat what's going on and preempt any issues moving forward. So absolutely, yes, I would recommend anybody who has a new diagnosis of um, endometriosis to have um, fertility screening. And the only test that we have available at the moment to assess fertility is an AMH or an anti-malarian hormone, which gives us an idea about your egg reserves. Repeated pelvic surgeries definitely diminish your egg reserves. Having endometriomas, we know, has a direct impact on your egg reserves. And so having that information from the outset is useful. Having said that, there's a lot of fear-mongering around fertility and endometriosis. And what is most reassuring is that the majority of women with endometriosis will, in fact, fall pregnant without any assistance. So I think that's a really important take-home message that even though women with endometriosis are overrepresented in the world of subfertility and infertility, most people with endometriosis will in fact fall pregnant without any concerns. We were referring to the staging of endometriosis earlier and there's really no evidence at all that staging correlates well to um, pain. So you can have a stage one endometriosis and debilitating pain and a stage four endometriosis and not substantial pain. Um, but it does seem to correlate quite well with impact on fertility. So if you've got a stage four endometriosis with quite impressive anatomical distortion, endometriomas, that kind of thing, we can have a relatively high index of concern that that may have a rollover effect on your fertility. If you've got a stage one endometriosis um, with minimal disease, the likelihood of impact is less. I've been talking so long, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> it was just about endometriosis and fertility so I think you've definitely covered covered that right. on that we might go talking egg freezing so when would be a good time for an individual to consider freezing of eggs and is it better to freeze eggs or embryos is this me excellent yeah um... why not <laughs> Um, so look, I think that the message will be out there within the next 15 years for everyone, not just people who have endometriosis, that we have this amazing technique to be able to press the pause button on your fertility when you are younger. Um, the risks are small, the potential advantage is high. I'll certainly be gifting my daughter um, some egg freezing for her 21st birthday um, I, and, you know, irrespective of endometriosis. Um, having said that, when should egg freezing be offered? So I guess firstly, egg freezing should be offered to everybody, irrespective of their AMH, irrespective of their, um, of their endometriosis status, because it is another one of the tools in our kit that can kind of give us options moving forward but it does have financial ramifications. And so not everyone's going to take that offer. Number two, the people who really should think a little bit more seriously about egg freezing um, are those people for whom uh, they have a lower than age expected AMH or those people who have endometrioma, even if their AMH is in normal range because they're more likely to have eggs of lower quality in that context. Eggs versus embryos is a tricky one. Um, so one of the tricky things about IVF is that not all eggs that are collected turn into embryos and not all embryos that are formed turned into a baby. And it's one of the most frustrating things and I'm sure Caroline can um, sort of reiterate from her time working in fertility nursing is that IVF is really the process of progressive disappointment because you get a number when you wake up of how many eggs you've collected and then you get another phone call the next day showing how many have fertilized which is always less and then you get a phone call three days later to say how many still alive and they're always less and then you get a final phone call on day five of how many embryos that have survived and it's always less so it's just this progressive decay of your hard work um, Eggs are the correct answer for anyone who's not in a long-term relationship and anyone who has the opportunity to harvest a good number of eggs. Um, if you don't know who you would like to be the father of your babies and you can get your 12 to 15 eggs if you're under 30 and probably 15 to 20 if you're between 30 and 35 and you're going to need many more than that if you're over 35, um, then you should be freezing eggs. 
if you are in a relationship and you know who the person who, for whom you would like to be the sperm donor for your eggs, then embryos are a bit more of a bankable currency in that. We don't really always know the conversion from eggs to embryos, as in how many eggs collected will translate into how many embryos. But we do know that once you're at the embryo stage, we've got about a 30 to 40%, depending on your age, chance of successful implantation. Um, so if you know who you're going to be making babies with, then embryos are probably a more reliable currency to be able to put in the bank for later. Thank you so much, Tina, for that. Um, I think I would really like to open up to questions because we've hit the seven o'clock mark. So I think I'd really like to open up to questions, um, whether they're over the chat or you can more than welcome to turn your microphones on and ask a question to one, um, one of the, our panellists. I do have a question here. I'm just trying to find where it's gone from um, Rianne. With magnesium, uh, what kind would you advise? I've looked at so many different ones and I haven't been able to find one particularly for endometriosis. Caroline, do you have any suggestions? Uh, yeah, look, magnesium is one people got, often get quite confused about. Um, the, I do kind of, I guess, have to point out there, there are over-the-counter um, options and there are practitioner only options which are usually um, a lot more research around them um, there's uh, often higher doses a lot better quality a lot better absorbed all of these things just make them overall a much better quality product um, so as the, it does depend on what the pre person is presenting with as to what type of magnesium that may be used. Um, a lot, uh, so you do get some that actually assist. If somebody is quite blocked up, you may actually want to help them along, more along the um, ones that, you know, magnesium citrate and so forth to try and actually get their bowels moving more. Um, a good one that I use quite a lot is um, magnesium bisglycinate. There are um, often then products where they have a bit of all the different types of magnesium. So I guess it's, it's trialling if you're just going to be getting over the counter. It is trying to get slightly better versions. The, the supermarket ones just don't usually cut it for people. So. Um, yeah. And most, of, most of our literature is around 600 milligrams of magnesium. And I have to confess that I didn't actually know all of that stuff you just said, um, Caroline, about the different preparations. Um, but most of our literature says 600 milligrams at night of magnesium. Is that about what you would be aiming for? Or is it really? That, that's quite a decent dose. Um, and yeah, it, it, a, a minimum of about 300. Okay. Um, and, and it does um depend as well you might space it over over the day um depending on what their with their needs um they may find if somebody's tolerating that um then that's that's fine if they're not tolerating that's when when you might and what kind of side effects would i expect to be seeing well that's when like their bowels might be starting to yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I love these meetings, I love them. Yeah, we'll come together, <laughs> absolutely. No, there's, um, so were there other, other questions or? There are a couple of other questions. I'm just checking them now. So how much does uh, a question um, that says, how much does adenomyosis affect fertility? I think that one would be for yourself, Tina. Mm. Um more than endometriosis. Um, so we know that endometriosis has an impact on the forming egg, so it does impair egg quality, it, it impairs the transit of the egg through the fallopian tube and it impairs the quality of the embryo that is created. But endometriosis per se doesn't tend to have a huge impact on implantation. 
it does have an impact on implantation, but not as big an impact as on implantation as adenomyosis. So adenomyosis is much more difficult to manage from a fertility perspective. Um, one of the it's one of the few conditions for which turning off all estrogen in order to be able to hormonally control prior to putting an embryo back in is really indicated. So, uh, and adenomyosis is much more associated with recurrent implantation failures than endometriosis alone and has a higher rate of miscarriage than endometriosis alone. So it's a bit of a troublemaker and we do our best to be able to turn it off prior to putting embryos back in. Alrighty, there's a few other questions that are coming in for yourself, Tina. We need to give Beck some love. We need some questions for Beck. Oh, well, I had some when I was talking earlier, but I had the, the group chat up at the side, so I answered them. Oh, Beck, awesome. I you typed them. You, Beck. Um, how do you select out the patients for whom you feel like there may be benefit from pelvic floor Botox? Because I'm actually quite reliant on you to be able to flag those people for me. So what are the features of somebody who's having um, pelvic floor physio that would make you feel like they may benefit from some Botox? There's probably a couple of things. Um, the, the patients that, you know, like, like kind of the flagged in my mind right at the start are the really, really tight introitus ones, the ones that like I can barely assess them because it's so painful for them. Um, and then they kind of flagged at the start and then it depends on how they progress. So if, if we plateau out in our progression or if physio isn't improving it, like really, like I would expect to see a difference within the first six to eight weeks of me treating somebody. Yeah. And if they come back and say, you know, it's exactly the same, there's no change, it's just as then that would be somebody that I would probably be like, right, well, we need to send you back to Tina. Um, most people I feel like have some kind of improvement in that time. Yeah. Um, but then again, you can have the one that does improve, but then kind of plateaus. And that would be another one that I would then look at for Botox as well. Yeah. And once the, the Botox has happened, do you notice a difference in terms of responsiveness to physio as well? Do you feel like they work synergistically? I do actually. And, um, I feel like you can, like those ones that you do, um, I guess had the, the beauty of assessing prior and afterwards that you can really feel the difference um, because it is protective muscle spasm. Like I guess the thing with Botox is that I feel like the physiotherapy is still really important with it because chances are that that spasm is going to come back. So still teaching them that stuff is really good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I've also got a question for Caroline. Um, so <laughs> sorry, Beck. Um, oh, that's right away. Um, wanting to ask about that group of patients who have synthetic hormone sensitivity. So we've all seen quite a few people, and I'm sure there are people in this group um, online tonight, um, who have difficulty in tolerating any form of synthetic hormones. Um, so either in any preparation, pills, implanon, marina, bizarre, any of the treatment preparations that we have. What tools do you have in your kit that can help to be able to optimize natural hormone cycling. So do you mean as far as like they get a lot of symptoms if they're on they don't feel like mean by... the mood symptoms yeah. or headaches or bloating or nausea? Um, yeah. so you, I'm sure you've met a lot of these women. Oh yeah, of course, but just um, <laughs> defining exactly what you were meaning by, by that. Um, yeah, look, I guess there are a lot of things at play. Of course, just some, t some people are just sensitive people. And e even when it comes to natural therapies, you have to go super, super gentle with them and slowly build them up. Um, I would be absolutely considering um, their liver detoxification pathways and what's actually um, happening there if they're just not able to process it. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and so that would be a, a big one. Um, as well, gut health, that is um, completely, you know, I've got a lot of um, 
uh, issues in the balance in that bacteria there. There's there's that part of it. So it, it can be tricky. And the, the, like I said, there can just be super sensitive people. Um, they, they often then do, um, once we get over those sensitivities, when there are, is a lot more balance in their life overall, um, they may their tolerance to things can can go up. So um, yeah, the, it it can be a, a challenge for them. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think I mean these patients are a challenge for everybody, and it's again, uh, you know, and they're often very frustrated by sort of medical treatments by the time they're reaching you and I imagine it's really difficult to be able to have uh, to develop that trust to be honest because it's certainly by the time we've gone through our long list of things that we want to try out we're kind of like ah oh, we're kind of out of out of options and it's really nice to be able to um, enlist that wider help again yeah okay. Alrighty, so there's a couple of questions that are coming through. Um, when is it, Tina, when is it time to call it um, quits or stop for having surgeries? Is large excisional surgeries with wired peritoneal lining removal is uh, as one of the last times you should be going in or is it reasonable to expect repeat surgeries until menopause or beyond? There's no blanket answer for this. It's very um, individualised. And sorry for saying exactly the same thing to every single question that you're asking me. No, that's okay. Um, uh, I guess we're not wanting to do more and more and more surgeries. A lot of whether you repeat surgery or not has to do with what the findings were from the last surgery and the duration of improvement from the last surgery and the use of our multidisciplinary support and the benefits gained from our multidisciplinary support. I'm much more likely to want to operate on somebody who said that they had a huge response um, from their surgery. They've done everything in their power, you know, with regards to hormonal control, they've accessed all of the other multidisciplinary cares, and they've tried to stretch out their recovery for as long as possible but they're finding it is impacting on their life again. I'm much more keen to operate on that person again if they're feeling that they had a good response that has been potentiated than somebody who didn't really get better from their last surgery. The question around wide peritoneal excisions is an interesting one because I have to say that would be my routine treatment for every single endometriosis surgery that I do. So I don't do spot endometriosis treatment whatsoever. Uh, my management would be a, a wide excision. I would do a butterfly, which means removing beneath both ovaries and overlying rectum peritoneum on probably about 70% of the people that I operate on. Because if there's endometriosis there macroscopically or that the eye can see, there's almost always endometriosis there microscopically. And we see that in our specimens when we're getting it back. So I think if you're going to have surgery, you might as well do the gig appropriately when you're having it um, and repetition is uh, so individualized I don't think that there's a correct answer to that one sorry Alrighty, and there's another uh, another question here. I'm having stage four um, endo and having excisional surgery this week. I'd like to know how long it would uh, reckon would like to. Sorry, it's really hard to read. I've got really small. I'm on my phone. I get it. She wants to know how long she'd recommend to try and thank you pathway following the excisional surgery. Um, so okay. I, mean, I think that this is really um, again pending on what is found at the surgery and. With some hope, the surgeon will also check your tubal patency at the time of the procedure and do a hysteroscopy and a lipoidal flush, which I'm, I'll probably ask Caroline to go into a little bit more in a minute um, to try and optimise your chances both of spontaneous conception and of, um, and of IVF success. Um, again, how long to try depends on your age, the duration of trying prior to your surgery, and your AMH or your ovarian reserves now. So it's not a blanket statement. Um, 
hypothetically, if you're 25 and your AMH is in normal range, I would say you should try for about six months following surgery. If you're, you've got, if you're 35 plus, if you have any impairment of your AMH, I think that should be shortened to three months and then to speak to your fertility specialist. Fantastic. And can everybody see the, um, all the panels? Can you guys see all the questions? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. There's another question here for Tina. Could you please explain how the Botox procedure works? Ah, so Botox works in the pelvic floor very similarly to how it works elsewhere in the body by paralyzing the striated muscle group. Um, so it stops you from being able to activate some of the muscles in the pelvic floor. So we're not aiming to paralyze the muscles that help you to have continence, um, but we are hoping to um, relax the muscle groups that are involved in involuntary um, or voluntary spasm that, that Beck was talking about beforehand. The one that starts when you know that sex is about to happen and you start getting uh, anxious about that. And so everything goes into lockdown. So we use it into three main muscle groups. So we put it in the pubococcygeus, puborectalis, and then to the transobturator muscles. It's always done under an anesthetic because needle in vagina. Um, but the relaxation is intended only to work alongside physio. So this isn't a standalone treatment. And Beck, what do you do when, um, like, following on for someone who has had um, pelvic, like, pelvic floor Botox? What are some, are you working on trying to lengthen the muscles? So we're working on trying to maintain the length and the relaxation that they've gained via the Botox. So the treatment's not dissimilar to what I would be teaching somebody who's coming in. I'm trying to get them to relax it. But I guess it's done more as a preventative type of thing um that the techniques are similar but really we're just trying to maintain what's going on um and just something else that like i was thinking about before when um carolyn was talking about the diet stuff and the symptoms that that you might get the other thing to remember too that is just a little often a little known fact like with um tight pelvic floors is that the pelvic floor is designed to you know keep things in like urine and poo um, but it's also meant to relax enough to allow passageway for those things to come out so if you are getting symptoms sometimes people you know think it's really odd when i first say to them you know do you ever find that when you do a bowel movement that you feel like you didn't empty it completely that you still need that, that you need to go do you have that feeling that there's something still there afterwards or the same like with their bladder um, and that is a really common thing with people with um, hypertonic pelvic floors because what's happening is the pelvic floor is kind of not allowing that passageway of things coming out. So it's, you know, not relaxing enough to let penises in, but it's also not relaxing enough to let things out. So it is really common that people will have, as Tina mentioned earlier, urgency and, um, you know, might feel like they're prone to constipation or might feel like they've got these funny bladder and bowel symptoms where they're feeling like they're not emptying it properly. And that's often to do with the tight pelvic floor as well. Thank you so much, Beck. That's really insightful. Alrighty. Are there any more questions that people have? I think there's a, a question here for Caroline. There's one from Gabby sort of looking at um, looking at managing symptoms whilst surgery is being delayed because courtesy of coronavirus, we yes. have to sort of call it the medical procedures. Um, so uh, maybe Carolyn Anbeck can address that. Okay, just trying to read through it too. Um, yeah, so while you're getting ready for surgery. Um, uh, yes, so as, um, as we talked about, yes, absolutely. Diet is um, a big component of that. Um, looking to see exactly what, um, what individualised diet um, that person needs. So a pretty base anti-inflammatory diet is important. Lots of... Um, fibrous foods, getting the bowels moving. Um, but a lot of people with endometriosis, it, it does come with a lot of gut symptoms. 
Um, and there's a, uh, so it is very much exploring that. And so for some people, um, finding out exactly what is causing some of the issues can be really challenging. And there are further testing that, that I do with some clients, whether it be to look at the balance of the bacteria in the gut um, or whether it's to go down a little bit of that food intolerance if they really can't figure out what's what's causing issues for them but um but as far as diet yes there are um, lots of anti-inflammatory foods lots of um, vegetables um, uh, and minimizing things like trans fats um, uh, minimizing sugar minimizing all these kind of things that we we know are, are not great foods often are very pro-inflammatory um, for people. So, and we've also got a question here from Sam. Um, I think it might be um, for Beck. Can having a hyperpelvic floor due to endometriosis affect women during um, childbirth? That's also probably a good one for Tina. Um, I think. <laughs> I think Sam and I might discuss this in person at some stage soon, right, Sammy? Um, I think <laughs> yeah, good probably. <laughs> Not long now. Maybe, Beck, you're a good person to start this one, though. So, yeah, yes, it can. If the pelvic floor is tight, um, there's obviously can be issues of the passageway for the baby coming out vaginally. Um, I don't know that we have any, and Tina, you might disagree, I don't think that we have any set research that says, you know, if you measure their vaginal pressure with a Peritron and it's this many millimetres per, you know, um, or whatever the thing is that we measure it with, um, per centimetre squared, like that they are going to tear more or be more at risk of a third degree tear. There's no research like that. So unfortunately, it's one of those things that we don't have a lot of guidance on being able to give people information on your pelvic floor is too tight to be able to go vaginally. Definitely, if you were pregnant and you had hypertonic pelvic floor, um, and if I had done an assessment on you and felt that your pelvic floor was tight, I would be encouraging you to have a discussion with your specialist about your mode of delivery. Um, but I would never probably say, this is going to tear, this is going to be terrible, because I don't know. We don't have that kind of information. There's absolutely no data in the literature and you know, it's, it's a bit of a dearth of the research, to be honest. There's a big gap there. Um, certainly, I look after a lot of women through their endometriosis, surgery, their IVF and then their birth, um, which has given me enough anecdotal experience to have a fairly good feel for it and to say that there doesn't seem to be any direct correlation. Um, so the wondrous thing about pregnancy is that you release uh, lots of relaxin, which is a hormone that causes muscles and ligaments to relax. Um, the pelvic floor is not involved in dilation of the cervix. That's all smooth muscle driven by the uterus. And so it certainly wouldn't stop you from being able to achieve full dilatation. Um, we certainly have a means of overcoming a hypertonic pelvic floor uh, uh, once the baby's head is low enough. Um, so that would mean potentially being able to facilitate birth with uh, vacuum forceps is ne if necessary. But um, conversely, we could say that the hypertonic pelvic floor may work to our advantage because when we're saying push, your pelvic floor is super strong. I might need my catcher's gloves on, Sammy. <laughs> I just want to take this opportunity to welcome Donald. Thank you so very much for joining us after your very, very busy day. We really do thank you. Your microphone is on mute, Donald. Yeah, we have Yay. a- Hi. Hey, hello. Uh, I apologize for this. Uh, we just, I just finished my last concert at seven o'clock. Thank you so much. What are you yeah, doing? What we have an happen? interesting day for this uh, COVID-19 and laparoscopic. What is the risk? We have a meeting about that uh, this morning to the impact of the COVID-19 on laparoscopic surgery. Are you still operating, Donald? Uh, I did operate on the COVID, uh, at risk COVID-19 patient yesterday um, in public. Um, are, you electively uh, are you electively operating at the moment? Where, have you shut uh, At the moment, the, uh, well, the, the things that in private, there's a patient has been booked, so I'll just continue but I'm not booking anymore. 
in the public, the I was being uh, I director general gave us the instruction that all the cat two and cat three has been removed from GCUH. Yeah, wow. that's and only a cat one that are allowed to see the patient. So anything a cat two and cat three are being removed as yeah. we speak. So this morning I got a phone call from the upper management to cancel my theater list. Um, Donald, did you want to um, give a brief overview, um, just a brief, brief overview of what you do and why you're passionate about working with women with endometriosis? <laughs> I don't know what to start, uh, Anika. Um, I don't know what, uh, <laughs> what are the things that the, I, I guess that the, um, um, been through this uh, before, seeing all the women, what I get frustrated is that all the, most of the women had a multiple surgery. And you can see that surgery has been done. I mean, the record I've seen is about 13, 13 laparoscopic surgery. Come to see me for third or fourth opinion. And the, 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 the problem is that the, uh, what I keep telling women is that the, the number of surgery does not equal to the outcome of your uh, endometrial treatment. So the, the, the reason why patients bought that is that the, uh, seeing all these women has been, well, I guess that the um, you know lo um, lots of issue in terms of the uh, whether it's a it's a it's a it's a lack of insight or or because of the uh, problem with the knowledge or because of the information being passed through uh, make me keen to help this type of woman to help them to go through uh, the the multidisciplinary or multimodality approach that the surgery is not the answer uh, for the treatment of the uh, endo matriosis and also keen to uh, see them through especially some of the vulnerable women um, that has suffering a lot uh, because of this uh, information being given a lot of mis myth and misconception being given to them and that's we are here to help them to guide them to the right direction thank you so much donald um we do have a question that someone has asked for you um, hi, Donald. I'm due to start IVF later this week. With COVID-19, um, will COVID-19 affect my, myself starting this? <laughs> I, I do not know what do I uh, want to, uh, how do I answer that question. The, the thing is, that AS, uh, if you look at the latest uh, publication from uh, American Society of Reportive Medicine, uh, they advise the, uh, there is no data at the moment uh, that COVID-19 can affect the, the uh, fertility. COVID-19, uh, impact of the COVID-19 on the uh, embryo and the egg collection. Uh, ASRM uh, published uh, uh, a few weeks ago, said that the, uh, they recommended to stop off the IVF cycle if that hasn't been uh, true yet. Uh, but if, it's, if the woman need to be in the process of having a IVF, they just go ahead with that. So at the moment, there's no data to suggest that the uh, that COVID-19 affected the fertility. COVID-19 does not uh, there's no data on the impact on the IVF and also the egg transfer. Yeah. Embryo transfer, sorry. ASRM and ESHRAE, so the American mm -hmm. and the European societies um, have stopped elective um, egg collections and elective embryo transfers. Uh, FSA, which is the Fertility Society of Australia, um, released a statement on Friday last week saying business as usual um, because of the reasons that Donald has suggested in that there's no evidence that the virus um, has a predilection for pregnant women and there's no evidence that the virus has increased risks to the, um, to the growing fetus. Um, however, FSA have had a repeat meeting tonight and I had a phone call immediately prior to starting this meeting to say that there will very likely be a different message as of tomorrow. So I think, uh, sadly, the short answer is probably yes, it will have an impact on your cycle plan for later this week. And there will obviously be exceptions to that rule. People who've been on prolonged Zolodex, people are having egg collections for malignancy, but I suspect that um, the changes will be in place before the end of the week. Can I just ask a question um, to, I suppose, both yourself, Donald and Tina, um, how does anatriptyline, um, I do know we've got a couple of pharmacists who are um, in this um, chat this evening, how does anatriptyline and drugs like anatriptyline and Symbolta 
um, have effects on the, the pain receptors for women with chronic pelvic pain? I, I don't think it affected the pain receptor. I don't think amitriptyline block on the uh, pain receptor. I think it's just the, uh, uh, they are, they are, if you look at the, 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 the pain in terms of the fiber, they are uh, the rapid acting and the slow acting uh, fibers. There are different type of the nerve fiber that uh, that causing this uh, pain. So I think the uh, one of the things that neuropathic pain is where that the uh, uh, amitriptyline and the pregabalin, the alkabapentin, work on that things. It work on the uh, I think if if I'm not wrong is I think it's work on the sodium channel to block that nerve to tra uh, travel through the to to the nerve. I don't think it's block on the receptor. Okay. But I'd be happy to be corrected if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's work on the receptor. It's not like opioids, uh, like new receptor uh, on the on the pain. Things it's on the nerve ending. Uh, are the, they well? But I bet they, if pharmacist on this page, you could probably answer it better than us. Yeah. Right are they um, useful with like? Do you prescribe them uh, for women with chronic chronic pelvic pain? As a third line treatment, yes. Okay. Not as a first line treatment, though. As a third line treatment. Yeah. Alrighty, there's a question here I can see for Beck. Does endometriosis have a link to uh pubic surfaces pain? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I can I can barely read it. I'm having to switch between three screens. No, on that's, here. Um, no, there's 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 no known link between endometriosis and pubic symphysis pain. Um, pubic symphysis pain actually just comes under the umbrella pelvic girdle pain in pregnancy, and um, it's a little bit off topic, but it, like something super interesting about that is that they haven't been able to find any link to somebody getting pelvic girdle pain during pregnancy, um, apart from if you've had it in pregnancies before. So it's not linked to BMI or exercise or anything else apart from if you've had one pregnancy and you had pubic symphysis pain or any kind of pelvic girdle pain, you're more likely to have it again in the second pregnancy. That's the only thing that we know is linked at this point in time. Alrighty, I'm just looking at the time. It's half past seven. I'm very conscious that people have lives. <laughs> um, is there any final questions that um, any of the listeners would like to address? If not, I'm happy to sign this off. Oh, I think there's one here for Tina that's just come through. Oh, wow, there's quite a few that are coming through. Can everybody see them? Uh, how difficult is it? Oh, Rianne, I think we've dealt with this directly. And yes, it would be nice for a better recognition around um, endometriosis as a chronic medical illness. But certainly I think people are getting more across this now and GPs are happy to write chronic um, chronic illness healthcare plans to be able to access physios and psychologists and dietitians and nutritionists and all the rest of it. Um, so that is where we're moving and that's part of what the endometriosis workforce and task force is looking to do to be able to increase accessibility as a result of the chronic health implications. How difficult is it to access hysterectomy for adenomyosis, Jazz? If you've got it and you have private health insurance, very easy. If you've got it and you don't have private health insurance, you pay with your time, not your money. Um, <laughs> Um, Donald probably can answer duration of time better for adenomyosis and hysterectomy. No? Um, yep. and <laughs> information around IVF meds on endo. Oh, yeah, that was a good question. I think we did that before. Um, so, fortunately, IVF treatment tends to be fairly short lived so there are not very many people who use the drugs for years and years and years but I happen to know as a result of uh, your own personal experience within the sphere as an IVF nurse um, that you will have definitely seen people on medications for years and years and years. We know that endometriosis is certainly fed by estrogen and the IVF drugs will facilitate very high levels of estrogen for a short amount of time. Um, we don't have any data to say that that accelerates endometriosis, but I think intuitively we would have to think that um, it is likely if you are having recurrent IVF stimulated cycles with high levels of estrogen, it's quite likely that your endometriosis will be recurrent sooner. Is that your vibe as well, Donald and Carolyn? 
Uh, yeah, well, from my side, I, I do work with people um, immediately after their IVF cycle. So even in between, if they're going to be between IVF and, um, sorry, egg collection and embryo transfer, work to try and just um, reduce the estrogen just that little bit in that tiny little window we have. But if the cycle was unsuccessful, um, I definitely work with people to um, try and clear out some of that estrogen afterwards. And they do find that um, exactly what you're saying, a, a, a short amount, um, you know, one cycle, people tend to recover okay from. It's the people that are having cycle after cycle that they find they're just putting on weight further and they find that their um, symptoms of, of their endometriosis may, you know, get worse with multiple cycles. So that's definitely something um, I work a lot with people with fertility before the IVF and getting them nice and ready so to try and get the best egg quality. And then afterwards, um, either from a pregnancy component, but from the clearing of the estrogen, there's some really beautiful nutrients that help um, help with that. Please um, sprout and so forth that um, that help help reduce that to, to try and be one of those things, with, um, one of the pieces of the puzzle in the endometriosis management. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. I I think we might call it a night because we have been on here for about an hour and a half or so. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming along to this evening's event. I really hope you've gained some useful tips and tricks to add to your toolboxes. I'd also like to thank our group of amazing panellists for joining us tonight and taking the time out of their very busy schedules, especially at this time during COVID-19. Please keep an eye out on Quendo's pages for a diverse range of um, virtual events over the next coming months. And please don't hesitate if you have any questions or concerns to contact our support line on 1300 for women If you require any assistance or support, our support line is checked daily. I'd really like to thank everybody who has chimed in tonight personally. It's been a couple of months planning this event, so I'm really, really pleased to see that we had over 40 people join in. Um, with this very late notice of change of venue from Gold Coast Private to online. So I personally would love to thank you um, for that. I look after the policy and all of Gold Coast events um, for q and So I'd really like to thank everybody for their support, especially during this really, really crazy time.